appreciate the opportunity to be here. I want my wife to stand so you can meet her. Honey, would you stand? 56 years we've been hanging out together, and uh, she would want you to know that she is eight years younger than I. But the Bible says train up a child in the way it should go. And it's really worked, brother. It's really worked. I tell young couples... Uh, the way to have a happy marriage is to stay on your honeymoon. And after 56 years, we're still on our honeymoon. Uh, now, let me mention uh, Ambassador Baptist College just briefly. Why don't you get on the internet and click on ambassadors with an S dot edu. Now, if you put if you don't put the S on, you're going to get Herbert W. Armstrong, and you don't want to do that. But every morning, how many of you homeschool your kids? Raise your hand. All right, several of you. They need, they need a chapel. And so on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have chapel at 10 o'clock. It's the most important thing that happens at Ambassador during the day. Uh, most Christian colleges or Bible colleges have a 35-minute chapel and 50-minute classes. That's sending a message. That's saying the classes are more important than the preaching. I don't believe that. Our chapel is at least an hour, and I'm sure that you would be encouraged and blessed by clicking on that. Now, we have several programs, and I won't go into that, uh, but we do have, for a young person who's not sure what God wants them to do, we have a one-year Bible certificate. And they get more Bible in that one-year Bible certificate than I got majoring in Bible. I got 32 hours of Bible in four years. They get 36 hours of Bible. Our girls, by the way, let me say this. We have made a survey, and Ambassador offers more Bible than any other Christian college or Bible college in America. The girls have 61 hours of Bible plus their uh, second major. Fellas have 65 or 60, 66 hours of Bible. When a person graduates from Ambassador, they can say, I have been from Genesis through Revelation in the classroom, and it is not survey courses taught by a career academician. It's a person who has been in the ministry for years and years. One of the founding principles of Ambassador was that I would not have any career academician. I was taught by men who had never been in the ministry. I thought that wasn't a good way to train young people uh, to serve the Lord. So all of our men, when our initial faculty came to us, they had 28 years of experience in the ministry. If you have any other questions, I'll be available at the table at the back. Uh, Christmas is coming up. Some of you need some uh, presents to give to some people who love the Lord. And you might think about some of the books. Here's my autobiography. 58 years in evangelism, 81 years on planet earth. Here's my book on prophecy, and then the book on the four crises of youth. Also, pick up our prayer card. We do have a flash drive or a USB stick with eight messages that are most requested of my ministry. Pastor mentioned to me, that the first message he heard me preach was a message on the holiness of God. That's one of the eight on the flash drive. And also my life story that was dramatized on Unshackle. All right, enough talking. Let's stand, please. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, thank God for these young people that were here. Now, Pastor, as my wife and I go across America... We see a lot of gray hair, but we don't see very many churches with the amount of young people that stood up here tonight. The last church we were in, uh, in Fairmont, West Virginia, uh, they, Victory Baptist Church, they have a lot of young people 
and it's so refreshing. We'll be going back to Shelby tomorrow, but it's so refreshing to be in two churches that have a large group of young people. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 27. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Thank you very much. You may be seated. History tells us that the logical successor to the Pharaoh of Egypt would have been his son. In the event that Pharaoh did not have a son, his daughter's son would be the next Pharaoh of the land. Now, most of you are aware how Moses became Pharaoh's daughter's son. You remember Pharaoh's daughter was down by the river of Egypt taking her daily bath. Now, she did not take a weekly bath. She took a daily bath. I had a roommate pastor in college that took a weekly bath. And folks, it was bad. It really was. We went to the dean of men, and we said, can we throw him in the shower and scrub him down? And he gave us permission to do that. One of the highlights of my college career And uh, his socks were so bad, they would almost stand up by themselves. But Pharaoh's daughter took a daily bath. Three fellows were riding down the road, and one fellow said, somebody's deodorant's wearing off. One of the other fellows said, ain't mine, I don't wear any. But anyway, (laughs) she took a daily bath. Well... As she was taking her daily bath, she heard some crying going on in the bulrushes. And she picked up this little baby boy and adopted him as her very own. Now, young people, can anybody, any young person tell me what the name Moses means? Anybody? To draw out of the water. So you see, you're not a young person. But you're a whole lot younger than I am, I'll tell you that. Uh, Everybody's young when they get to my age. But anyway, every time she addressed him by name in the palace, she was reminded she drew him out of the water. Now make no mistake about it. Moses was being groomed to be the next Pharaoh of the land. Acts 7.22 And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and in deed. You know what that means? When he walked out the door on occasion, trumpets blew. People fell down on their faces and did obeisance to him. He wore the finest robes of his day. He rode in the finest chariots of his day. He had the finest private tutorage of his day. But there came a time in Moses' life when he had a choice to make. Am I going to waste my life in the palace of the king as Pharaoh over the land of Egypt? Or am I going to let my life count for God? Tonight I'm speaking on this subject. What? are you going to do with your life? Now, my outline is taken from the text. I wish I could claim credit for this outline, but God put it in the text. Three words that start with the letter R. Number one, verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Number one. His refusal. I want to ask, have you ever refused anything for the will of God? If you have not, then you're not in the will of God. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Moses is in the palace. And he's looking out, seeing his Hebrew brothers under hard labor and bondage. 
They were bent over in the red-hot Egyptian sun making bricks out of slime and mortar. And the Egyptians would come along with their scorpion-like whips and crack them on the back. Well, Moses watched all of that he could take. He went down. He killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. With that act, he was saying no to the palace and yes to the will of God. Now, wait a minute. I'm not saying it was the will of God for Moses to kill that Egyptian. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that from the time he killed that Egyptian, he could never be king over the land of Egypt. Are you willing to refuse? There comes a time when a girl has to refuse a boyfriend for the will of God. We were just in San Antonio, Texas, and there were two uh, girls, single missionaries, girl missionaries in that meeting. And I believe with all my heart, those young ladies did things that I could not do on the mission field. But there was a time in their life when they had to refuse a boyfriend. The boyfriend may have been a good Christian. He may have read his Bible. He may have gone on soul winning, but he wasn't called to go to the mission field. Those young ladies had to say no to those boyfriends for the will of God. There comes a time when a man has to refuse a raise in salary, a promotion in job for the will of God. Hey, the average Christian makes his decision based on a material reason. And when the average Christian goes to get a job, his sole motivation is, how much does it pay? It is not, is this the will of God for my life? I tell our students, don't make life decisions based on a material reason. Why? Lot went to Sodom. Why? A material reason. It was a good place to raise cattle. A dreadful place to rear children. Abraham went to the land of Canaan. He had never been there before. He didn't know what the land of Canaan was like for raising cattle. But I will tell you, his eyes were far above the land of Canaan. He looked for a city that had foundation, whose builder and maker is God. So he refused his wealth to follow the will of God. Are you willing to do that? There comes a time when a young person, listen carefully, has to refuse a scholarship to a college for the will of God. You say, well, I got a scholarship doesn't that prove it's the will of God? I say, show me that in the Bible. You know, the devil will give you a scholarship to keep you out of the will of God. I'm asking you, are you willing to refuse? Luke 9 and verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's denial. Luke 14, 26. If any man will come to me, and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, and his sisters. Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, young people, what does it mean when God says we're to hate our father and mother, etc.? You see, in the Bible, terms of emotion are terms of comparison. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So what Jesus is saying is this. I am to love the will of God so much that even the love for my father, mother, brothers, sisters, etc. will seem as hatred in comparison to my love for the will of God. Do you love the will of God that much? Paul was getting ready to leave Ephesus. He had labored there for three years. And the mighty Elders said, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, they're liable to kill you. They're liable to stone you. They're liable to put you in prison. You know what Paul responded? Acts 20, 22 through 24. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that befall me there, save that in every city saying, bonds and afflictions abide me. But here's what he said. None of those things move me. 
Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. You know what he was saying? He's saying, listen, I settled out a long time ago on the road to Damascus when I said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And I believe the very moment that Paul was saved, he received the call to serve God. I believe that was true in my life. I was saved at the age of 15, 67 years ago. And I want to say I believe the night I got saved is the very night God called me to preach. Because I settled it, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Have you ever said that? Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, But those things which were gained to me, those I counted lost for Jesus Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know what he was saying? He is saying, I've counted my own will to be garbage, refuse, in comparison to my love for the will of God. Galatians 6 and verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. That's refusal. Galatians 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I ask you tonight, are you willing to refuse your own will for the will of God? I had come back from Kenya, Africa in 1976, our first mission field trip. And I'll tell you, Pastor, uh, Brother David, the, the first night I was there, it changed my life. I used to hear missionaries say, you cannot know the needs of the field unless you see it firsthand. And I thought that was public relations to get to go to the mission field. But boy, the first night I was there, we went through roads that very human beings have ever been. Those roads were so bad, my song leader's wife, Ms. Brubaker, was sick for three days on those roads. And I thought to myself, why in the world are we going on these roads? There couldn't be any human beings back here. But when we got to the place where I was to preach, there was a tent set up and over a thousand people in that tent. And probably 75% had never been born again. That night there were over 100 professions the first night we were in Kenya, Africa. And so I told the preacher, I said, listen, I will never be the same. Before I started Ambassador Baptist College, we would spend six to eight weeks every year on mission fields at our own expense around the world. Why? Because I found that I could reach more unsaved people in one night, accidentally, than I could in revival meetings in three months on purpose. And so when I came back from Kenya, I was all stirred up about getting laborers to go to Kenya. I preached in Clovis, New Mexico in 1977 in January. And I preached my burden about getting laborers to go to Kenya. God looked down that meeting and he saw Bill Finch. He'd spent 21 years in the military as a mechanic. He was getting ready to get out, set up a garage and work for himself. God reached down and he said, Bill Finch, I don't want you wasting your life in a Chevrolet garage. I want you in my service. You know what he did? He left his nets, went on deputation, went to Kenya, Africa for 25 years, starting churches, also a maintenance mechanical missionary. Hey, 1978, I preached in Marshalltown, Iowa where Brother Imboden surrendered his life for the ministry. Not only did he surrender in that meeting, Dennis, uh, Bob Matney, who was superintendent of the public school, high-paying, prestigious job, God looked down and he said, Bob Matney, I don't want you wasting your life in the public school. I want you in my service. You know what he did? He went to Newington, Connecticut. Half the salary he was making in Marshalltown, Iowa. 
I preached in that Christian school where he was headmaster. 47 young people came down the aisle and surrendered for full-time Christian service. Bob Matney got up before those young people and he said, young people, five years ago in a Ron Comfort meeting, I did the same thing you've done today. You know why I did it? He said, if I spent all of my life in the public school, I could never see 47 young people surrender for full-time Christian service. I ask you tonight, are you willing to refuse? I'm never concerned, Pastor, about a young person who comes to me and says, Brother Cuppard, I hope I find the will of God for my life. Now there's a promise connected to that, John 7, 17. If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know. Young people, two things you need to know the will of God. Psalm 40 and verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. So the two things you need are, number one, you need a desire to do the will of God. Number two, you need to validate the will of God by the word of God. Pastor, do you know the name J.T. Lyons? Do you know that name, David? He's one of the greatest missionaries of our day. He's in heaven now. 1986, we were coming back from Spain. But we met J.T. Lyons. And J.T. came to me and he said, Brother Comfort, let me tell you how we came to Spain. He said, I had spent 28 years in Liberia. I was a bush pilot. God had given us a new plane. And so I was coming home on furlough and came through Spain. And God began to speak to my heart about Spain. And he said, I started arguing with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm 58 years of age. I had a hard time learning the language in Liberia. At 58, I can't learn another language. He came home on furlough, church to church. He'd still think about Spain, Spain, Spain. One night he went to bed and couldn't sleep. He tossed and turned. He got up and he opened his Bible to Romans chapter 15 and verse 24. It says, when I come into Spain, I will come unto you. So he went and he woke his wife up and he said, honey, it is settled. We're going to Spain. He validated the will of God by the word of God. Are you willing to refuse? All right, number two. Will you notice please verse 26. Number one is refusal. Number two, his reproach. Verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. His reproach. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Again, Moses is in the uh, palace and he's looking out at his Hebrew brothers. And he sees them fighting each other. So he goes down and he breaks them up. He says, wait a minute, fellas. We're in this thing together. If we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately. You can't be fighting each other. You know what they said to him? They said, big shot, who made you a judge and a ruler over us? Who do you think you are? We saw what you did yesterday when you killed the Egyptian and you buried him in the sand, you're in big trouble with the Pharaoh of Egypt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from that time on, he could never be Pharaoh over the land of Egypt by killing that Egyptian. And because of that, they started reproaching him. And ladies and gentlemen, they reproached him all the way for 40 years. In Numbers 14 and verse 22, it says they murmured against Moses ten times. Now you will see that phrase many times in the Bible. Ten times. And it means over and over and over and over again. Now get this. One month after he had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea one month later. They came to a place called Merah and the people murmured against him. 
Exodus chapter 17, they came to a place called Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. And so they picked up stones and they were about to stone Moses. How do you think Moses responded? You think he said, now wait a minute. You're taking this out on me and all I'm doing is following God. If you don't like it, take it out on God. Don't take it out on me. You think he responded like that? No. You think he said, all right, you want to stone me? Step out of here, put them up one by one. We'll see who's going to stone whom. You think he said that? No. I love what it says in Exodus 17 and verse 4. When they picked up stones to stone Moses, it says, and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying. That was his place of refuge. Ladies and gentlemen, I have in the front of my Bible four words. No attack, no defense. Did you get that? No attack, no defense. And I believe that that was Moses' attitude when they picked up stones to stone him. And at that time, I believe the devil reached down in Moses' ear and he said, Moses, you're a dumb fool. You could be sitting in the palace of the king as Pharaoh over the land of Egypt and these people don't appreciate you. They murmured against you every step of the way. I think the saddest chapter in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy chapter 34. Now get it. Moses is taken up to Mount Nebo. And God says, Moses, look over there in the promised land. He said, you can see it, but your feet are not going to touch down in it in this life. Why? Because don't you remember Moses? I told you to speak to the rock and you smote the rock. You disobeyed me and you will not get to enter the promised land in this life. You know what I believe the devil said at that time? He said, Moses, ha, 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 that's some God you've got there. The children of Israel murmured against you for 40 years. They didn't appreciate you. You could be sitting in the palace of the king and now your God isn't even going to let you enter the promised land. You know what I believe Moses said? I believe he said, Satan, shut up! Shut up! If I had it to do over again, I'd do the same thing. Why? It's better to suffer reproach in the will of God than to sit in the palace of the king outside of the will of God. Did you get that? It's better to suffer reproach in the will of God than to sit in the palace of the king outside of the will of God. Philippians 1.29 For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on His name, but also to suffer for his sake. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12, if we suffer with him, what? We shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, I want you to listen to this. Since Tiger Woods entered the PGA in 1996, he has made $1.4 billion dollars. Billion with a B. He spent $54 million on a private jet. He bought a yacht 155 feet long for $25 million. He bought 10 acres of property in Jupiter, Florida for $55 million. He takes his own furniture with him to PGA events so he can be comfortable. I'm going to tell you something. The best day that Tiger Woods has had with all of his toys is worse than the worst day I've had in serving God. And the world can't understand that in the midst of persecution, the child of God can still have the joy bells ringing in his heart. Acts chapter 4, Peter, James, and John are taken in the Sanhedrin. They said, you better shut your mouth about this man, Jesus. If you don't, we're going to cut your body to rivets with the cat of nine tails. You know what they said? Acts 4 and verse 20. They said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Go ahead and beat us. We're still going to preach about Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, it was different. This time they were not threatened. They were beaten. 
You know how they were beaten? 13 times on the right side, 13 times in the center, 13 times on the left side. And they left the Sanhedrin that day, Acts 5 and verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Do you get that, ladies and gentlemen? They left the Sanhedrin, their bodies were gushing blood, but you know what they were doing? They were singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And the only place of peace and happiness is in the will of God. You know, the worst thing these Jews could do was to kill a Christian because the more they killed the Christian, the more the Christians grew and multiplied. Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, that they that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Acts chapter 12, James says his head cut off. Acts 12 and verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Why? Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, do you know that every disciple that Jesus had died a martyr's death? Except John. John was boiled in hot seething oil, banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he died a slow, painful, agonizing death. James, the brother of our Lord, when he was 92, was taken to prison, beaten with a leaded whip, the cat of nine tails, but on his way to his execution, he led his executioner to Christ. And they both went out and died a martyr's death. Matthew was slain with a large knife. Mark was dragged to death by the Peter of Alexandria. Luke was hanged on an olive tree. They got ready to crucify Peter. You know what Peter said? He said, no, I'm not worthy to die the way the Son of God did. So at Peter's own request, they crucified him upside down with his head pointing toward the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that's the origin of the so-called peace symbol or the broken cross? When Titus and his Roman soldiers marched into Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and they leveled the city, they carried the inverted or the broken cross. That has always been a symbol of anti-Christendom. And then I think about the Mamertine prison. No place that I've ever been in my life except the open tomb of Christ affected me like being in the Mamertine prison. You go in the Mamertine prison in Rome and there's a a stone floor with a grade. They would remove the grade. They would take the victim and throw him down to a dark, damp, dingy, dismal dungeon. On one side, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. On the other side, he was chained to a Roman cell. As he would lie there on the floor, he could watch the rats as they gnawed away at his body. He could watch the lice as they crawled all over his body. And the guy told us just before they cut off the head of the Apostle Paul, are you listening? He led 37 of the guards to Jesus Christ. And as they cut off the head of the Apostle Paul, he was singing the praises of God. They had something, didn't they? I think about Polycarp, the aged pastor of the church of Smyrna. When Polycarp was well in his 90s, he was taken to the proconsul, urged to renounce his faith in Christ and escape martyrdom. Polycarp came out with these famous words. He said, 80 and 6 years have I served the Lord Christ, and he's never done me anything but good. They led this tottery old man out to nail him to the stake. They started to pound the ten-inch spikes in his hands. He said, no, no. He said, you don't have to nail me to the stake to secure my remaining in the fire. He said, the same God that gave me grace to come to the fire will give me grace to remain in the fire without being nailed to the stake. And that day as they doused his body with pitch and they lit a match, Polycarp was heard praying this, I thank thee, O God, that thou hast preserved me until this moment 
and given me the opportunity of taking my place among the martyrs. My, oh my. And I'm talking to some people in here tonight who won't stand up for Christ. And you deny Jesus Christ by your silence like Peter did. When somebody on your job uses God's name in vain, you warm your hands with the enemies of God and don't say a thing. God help us. All right, number one is refusal. Number two is reproach. Why? Because of number three, his reward. Notice, please, verse 26 again. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches and the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Get it. Moses' eyes were on the finish line. And the distractions on the periphery did not bother him. His eyes were on the finish line. I tell our preacher boys this. When somebody gives you a compliment, let it go in one ear and out the other. If it lodges in the middle, you're in trouble. But there is a compliment that I relish. It's what the preacher said. Fifty-eight years I have preached, and many times people come to me and say, Brother Comfort, I heard you 50 years ago, and you have not changed. I've got a stock answer. I'm too close to the finish line now to change. And folks, I'm not looking at what I did yesterday. I'm looking at what I'm doing today and tomorrow, because there's a finish line I've got my eyes on. And the reward is threefold. Number one, there's the well done when we cross the finish line. Second Timothy 4, 6 to 8, Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me of that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, you remember that I told you in Deuteronomy chapter 34 that Moses was forbidden to enter the promised land in this life. All right, get it. About 1,500 years later, Jesus is getting ready to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John are with him. Get it. Who do they see on the Mount of Transfiguration? They see Moses and Elijah. You know why? I believe God came to Moses and he said, Now Moses, you remember I didn't let you enter the promised land in your lifetime? But well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to take you to the promised land with me now. So there's a well done. Number two, there's the peace and joy we have in our heart. John 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Young people, the peer group tells you, if you surrender for the will of God, God's going to make you miserable. I'm going to tell you who will make you miserable. The peer group will make you miserable. The only place of peace and happiness is in the will of God. I was preaching about 45 years ago, Pastor, in Atlanta, Georgia. And a young Georgia Tech student came to me and he said, Brother Comfort, do you remember uh, the message you preached on the holiness of God? He said, somebody gave me that tape and I played it through one time. And he said, I sat there with my mouth open, different than anything I had heard about God and His nature. He said, I turned it over, put it back in the second time. When it finished the second time, I was on my knees asking Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. So that was 45 years ago. Three years ago, I was preaching in Blairsville, Georgia. After the Sunday school, a man walked in who was well-dressed and, and just a, a, a real picture of success. And he came to the pastor and he said, Pastor, he said, I want to talk to Brother Comfort, but I don't want to talk to him before he preaches. I don't want to get his mind off the message that he's preaching. So after the service was over, this man came up to me and introduced himself as Dr. Will Moody. 
He said, Brother Comfort, do you remember the Georgia Tech student that came to you about 40 years ago or so and said he listened to your tape on the holiness of God? He reached in his pocket and he pulled out that tape and he said, here's that tape. He said, I was that medical student. I said, well, Dr. Moody, let me give you a seed... uh, Uh, a CD. It's up to date. He said, you couldn't pay me to give up this tape. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Can we get together this week, and I'd like to hear about the circumstances surrounding your salvation. He said, great. He said, on Tuesday, I have 11 surgeries. One of the greatest surgeons in the state of Georgia. He said, on Wednesday, we can get together. So we got together in a restaurant. And I said, now, uh, Dr. Moody, tell me about the circumstances surrounding your salvation. He said, well, I was in my frat house in Georgia Tech. And he said, my frat brothers were in the next room smoking pot and drinking liquor. He said, but you know what I was doing? He said, I was on my knees with my Bible open And I was praying and weeping. And I said, oh God, please send somebody along to show me how to be saved. He said, when I got up from my knees, a knock came to the door. He said, I went to the door and here was a young man from a college ministry. He introduced himself as Rich. And I said, Rich, I said, I've been praying on my knees just before you knocked on the door that God would send somebody along to show me how to be saved. Can you show me how to be saved? He said, yes, I can. He said, but let me do this first. Here's a tape on the holiness of God. I want you to listen to it, and then I'll come back and tell you how to be saved. He didn't have to tell him how to be saved. Dr. Moody got saved by listening to that tape. Now, before we left that luncheon, he looked at me and he said, Now, Brother Comfort, I hope this will not offend you. But he said, I'd like to give you something. He gave me an envelope with 16 $100 bills. It didn't offend me, preacher. (laughs) But let me tell you something. That money's been spent a long time ago. A long time ago. But the thrill of hearing his testimony. He said, my wife got saved. My children got saved. They're in Christian colleges. And they're training to serve the Lord. I'll tell you, the joy of that will never leave me until the day that God takes me home to glory. Yes, there's the peace we have in our heart. And number three, finally. In Luke chapter 18, 28 through 30, Jesus was approached by Peter, and Peter said, Jesus, we've left all and followed you. What are we going to get out of it? And Jesus said, Peter, you'll not only get in the life to come life everlasting, but in this life you'll get manifold more. That's the third part of the reward. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 30, it says, No man has left father, mother, house, land, wives, and children but I'll multiply unto you a hundredfold. That's the third part of the reward. You know, God started doing that to me when I got saved at the age of 15. We had moved back to Elmira, New York, my birthplace, from Asheville, North Carolina. And I was singing in the nightclubs from the ages of 7 to 15. I sang in the nightclub stage, radio, and TV. Instead of being in a service like this on Sunday night, I was generally in a nightclub singing somewhere. Had to be accompanied by my grandfather and my dad because I was underage. And so when God saved me, immediately my brother came home and he got me involved in soul winning. We would go in the streets of Elmira, we would pass out tracts, and we would take the wordless book and show kids the plan of salvation. And so we were having a street meeting in Elmira, New York. And all of a sudden, as Billy was preaching, my brother, the policeman came and he said, boys, you can't do this. He said, you've got to get a permit from the police department in order to do this. Well, across the street from where we were holding the street meeting was the Elmira Rescue Mission. Al Shaw, the superintendent, saw our plight. He came over to my brother and he said, boys, he said, I've heard what you're preaching. He said, I love it. 
He said, I was a drunkard. I was a no good. And God saved me with a message I heard you preach. He said, whereas you cannot preach on the street, he said, you can preach in that rescue mission across the street. And he said, Billy, he said, I want you to do the preaching for three weeks. He said, Ronnie, I want you to do the singing. So for three weeks we held meetings. I came to my dad during that time and I said, Dad, God saved me. He's called me to preach. And if you will let me, I'll go to Bob Jones Academy and I'll begin to preparing to be a preacher in the 10th grade. He said, son, you're a fool. He said, well, we've got good schools here. Why do you have to traipse off 700 miles down to Greenville, South Carolina and, and go to the academy down there? I said, Dad, all I can tell you is God saved me. He's called me to preach. He said, son, everything we've worked for is down the drain. I said, Dad, that's in the past. I don't care about that anymore. I said, if you will let me, I'll go to Bob Jones Academy and I'll begin to prepare to preach. He said, son, you can go. But he said, if you go, I will not send you one penny. In the three years I was in the academy, my daddy sent me zero. And the academy cost the same as the university did in those days. The four years I was in college, one weekend my dad broke his word and he sent me five dollars. In seven years, he sent me a total of $5. But I'll tell you how God began to multiply to me fathers and mothers. After the three weeks meetings in the rescue mission, Al Shaw called me to the platform on the last night. And he said, Ronnie, he said, the offerings have been $150. And these were his exact words. He said, you're my Timothy. You're my son in the faith. He said, I want you to take this $150 and apply in Bob Jones Academy. So God multiplied unto me a daddy. My first year in the academy, I had a roommate whose name was Billy Shelton. Billy lived in the dorm. His parents lived in Greenville. I believe God put him in the dorm for my benefit. One day Billy came to me and he said, Ron, he said, I've told my mom and dad about you and they want to meet you. He said, would you be willing to go home for supper with me this week? I said, Billy, I'd be glad to. Right away, God established a wonderful relationship with mom and dad Shelton and me. And they said, Ron, as long as you're at Bob Jones Academy or Bob Jones University, every weekend you'll go to the mailbox and you'll find an envelope from mom and dad Shelton with the money for your incidentals and sometimes a check to apply to your room board and tuition. Again, God multiplied unto me a father and a mother. After my senior year in high school, I went out to Caldwell, Idaho with a classmate, Ed Shaw. And Ed said, we can get you a job on construction. So I worked as a hod carrier for a bricklayer for five weeks. Our house was finished, we were working on. And I looked all around Caldwell for some work and couldn't find any. Somebody came to me and said, Ron, if you can get to Chicago, there are good jobs and they pay well. You can earn some money to go back to school in the fall. So I hitchhiked from Caldwell, Idaho to Chicago, Illinois. I stayed in the YMCA hotel for two weeks and I came within a hair of finding a job. I guess I should say I came within a half an inch of finding a job. I went to the railroad and they measured me. And they said, you're five feet five and a half. And we don't hire anybody who is under five feet six. I think I'm going to sue them. But anyway, the last day I was in Chicago, I got a call from a classmate, Barbara Bentley, in Buffalo, New York. Number one, I don't know how she knew to get in touch with me in the YMCA hotel. Number two, I don't know how she knew I needed a job. She said, Ron, I've talked to my mom and dad, and they want you to come to Buffalo and stay in our home this summer. My dad's an electrician, and you can be his helper for the rest of the summer and make some money to go back to school in the fall. So I hitchhiked from Chicago to Buffalo, stayed with the uh, Bentleys for the rest of the summer. One day they came to me 
And they said, Ron, we have one daughter, Barb. We feel like we've got a son, you. And they said, if you have a need, don't hesitate to call on mom and dad Bentley. I went back to school that fall, got a basketball injury, had a cartilage operation. I was lying on the hospital bed, getting behind on my bill, getting behind on my work. I was discouraged. And I got that dreaded letter from the business office. They said, Ron, we have kept you as long as we can without your being able to pay on your bill. If your bill is not paid by this date, we have no recourse. We must send you home. Folks, I didn't know where that money was coming from. Before that day was over, I got a letter from the Bentleys. And I opened the letter up and it said, Ron, we love you. We think of you as our son. God has laid it on our heart to send you this check. Evidently, you need it. You know how much that check was for? The exact amount to the penny that I owed in the business office. Again, God multiplied unto me a mom and a dad. After my freshman year in college, Fred Skills from Roseburg, Oregon, six feet four, 210 pounds, came to me and he said, Ron, he said, I've told my folks about you. And my dad's in the lumber business. If you can come to Roseburg this summer, you can stay in our home and work in the sawmill for three summers. I did that. And one day, Verl Skills, the father, came to me and he said, Ron, we have two daughters, Kathy and Karen. We have one son, Freddie. And now we feel like we've got a little son. We feel like you're our son. And don't you hesitate to call on mom and dad skills if you have a need. Now folks, when my three daughters were growing up, every Christmas we would get a letter and a card and a check from the skills. And the letter would say, divide this five ways. Three ways for our grandchildren, my daughters. Two ways for our children, my wife and me. They sent us money to go from Clarksburg, West Virginia to Roseburg, Oregon at Christmas. They flew from Roseburg to Tampa, Roseburg to Phoenix just to be in our meetings. And I believe that if they were living today and I had a need, I could call Dad Skills and say, Dad, I need $10,000. Can I borrow $10,000? I believe that a check would be in the mail before the week was over for $10,000. Now, folks, why did God do that? I'm getting ready to close. The first Christmas I was home after being at Bob Jones Academy for three months, my mom and dad were drunk nine out of ten days. The snow was two to three feet deep outside. Our house was heated with oil. The oil had run out. There was no heat in the house. And the last night I was home, mom and dad didn't even come home to be with me. And I sat in a rocking chair covered up with covers. I could see my breath. It was so cold. And I thought, nine out of ten days, my mom and dad had been drunk. They haven't come home to be with me the last night. And I stayed around the house a long time the next day just praying that mom and dad would come home and kiss me goodbye and tell me they love me. Finally at 10 o'clock in the morning, I went out to the highway, stuck out my thumb. Tears were streaming down my face. I thought nine out of 10 days, my parents have been drunk. The last night I'm home, they haven't come home to be with me. And the last morning, they haven't even come home to kiss me goodbye and tell me they love me. But let me tell you something, folks. God has made that up to me manifold times since then. And I say I am what I am tonight for one reason, the will of God. The will of God. Some of you tonight are struggling with the will of God. You're like the poet. I said, let me walk in the fields. He said, no, walk in the town. I said, but there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers, but a crown. I said, but I'll miss the light and friends will miss me, they say. He said, choose today whether I am to miss you or they. I pleaded for time to be given. He said, 
Is it hard to decide? Twill not seem so hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I took one look at the fields, then cast my face toward the town. He said, my child, will you yield? Will you give up the flowers for the crown? Then into my hand went his, and into my heart came he. And now I walk in the light divine, the path I had feared to see. Hallelujah for the will of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And I ask my wife to come to the piano and play, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. Now I want you to listen carefully because I'm going to ask a, an invitation question differently than I ever have in this pulpit. Listen carefully. How many of you, since you were saved, came to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to do your will. Wherever, whatever it may be, I'm surrendering my life to do the will of God. And you can honestly say tonight, if I know my heart, I'm where God wants me, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I have surrendered my life, not only am I saved, but I've surrendered my life for the will of God. And tonight, I'm going to stand to my feet to let you know I've surrendered my life for the will of God. If you can honestly say that, stand to your feet right where you are, please. I have surrendered my life to do the will of God.